In today's video, we're gonna talk about all things subacromial impingement. Let's go. So from a pathophysiology and etiology point of view from subacromial impingement syndrome, there are basically thoughts that it's an external abrasion of the rotator cuff and bursa caused by the acromial surfaces, basically. So there's that typical kind of impingement um, hypothesis. Now, actually, as we look at the research and we look at a really good paper by Jeremy Lewis, he talks about the fact that there's actually a lack of concordance regarding the area of tendon pathology and acromial irritation. There's also a, a lack of the, sh the shape of the acromion and symptoms, so the shape doesn't necessarily uh, you know, relate to symptoms. And the third, or third problem with this is the proposal that irritation leads to the development of tendonitis and bursitis has not been linked. And fourthly, imaging changes and symptoms and the development of the condition is not um, in conjunction with each other. So all of these things we know that can happen independently and not and are not directly related and therefore they kind of call into question whether these this old school way of thinking is actually correct in addition there's no certainty that any benefit derived from surgery is due to the removal of the chromium as research suggests that a bursectomy in isolation may confer equivalent benefit and it's also possible or been shown to be possible that with relative uh, rest uh, after surgery, this is what may be causing the homeostasis and so it may actually be placebo effect of the, of the surgery really and just giving it time to recover. Um, this view is also strengthened by the fact that we know that when you compare surgery to exercises, there's not actually that much difference. In fact, with this condition, if you look at two years post-op versus an exercise group, there was very, very little difference in outcomes. So it really begs into question whether this condition should be seen um, surgically unless absolutely necessary. Epidemiology wise, there's about a seven to 34% uh, prevalence of shoulder pain seen in primary care in the UK and it's believed that uh, shoulder impingement is the most common of these shoulder complaints accounting for about 45 to 65 percent of shoulder pain cases. What's also been shown in the studies is that about 54 percent of those people that are, uh, present with shoulder impingement syndrome still have symptoms three years post onset so it tends to be a condition or seems to be a condition that has a very chronic um, prognosis. So when we look at diagnosing this condition, we first look at our subjective markers, our key subjective markers we want to look for with a patient when they come in. So the first one we'd look for is really an insidious onset of pain. So it's rare to have a traumatic cause with this pathology and it also comes on over a matter of weeks and months. It tends to be seen in the anterolateral shoulder, quite localized around this region, although it can refer down into kind of the lateral arm as well. Patients tend to have a loss of range of motion, but more pain and a painful arc of range of motion, which we'll go on to talk about in our objective tests. Pain is very specific to movements. It's very movement-based. It's when they're doing certain movements, particularly overhead movements, behind the back movements. Um, those are the sorts of movements where you'll get this uh, condition in terms of the aggravating activities. Patients get pain when they're lying down on the shoulder, so quite a common thing when you ask them about night pain, they'll say if they lie on their shoulder, it causes pain. The condition tends to be eased by rest, so at rest they tend to not have many problems unless it's really irritated, but even then they'll find that it's when they're doing things that it causes the problem. And it can also be eased by NSAIDs as well. Now in our objective testing and our special testing, we have a test cluster for the subacromial impingement syndrome. And I've gone into this in more vid uh, detail in another video. So there'll be a card that's on this video that comes up now where you can actually see me physically go through these tests. So if you wanna have a look at that, click on the link here or in the description and you can go through to that. But we'll just run through the names of the tests that you would go through as a cluster to then see whether this is something that you'd be worried about or not. So the first test is Hawkins-Kennedy test. Second test is our near test. Third test would be our painful arc. Fourth test would be our empty can test. Fifth test would be our external rotation resistance test. And the sixth test would be a drop arm sign. Other tests which can often be used and I've gone through in my other video would be the Jurgsen's test, speeds test, the horizontal adduction sign test. 
So treatment for this condition really should be based around physiotherapy, um, exercising and rehabilitation. Secondly, if this is not working or actually in cases I often find where patients are really struggling to do exercises because of pain, so pain is limiting them with exercises or really, really affecting their function, maybe they've got some uh, tasks at work they need to do that I'm really struggling with, then a CSI, so corticosteroid injection, is often used for these patients as well. It allows them a little bit more movement, usually less pain, and then allows them to crack on with their rehab, and usually that will be enough. Obviously, in certain patients who don't improve over long periods of time, then subacromial decompressions are sometimes done, and surgery is sometimes done in these patients. Now again, like I said before, this should not be the first port of call with treatment because we know that exercises and surgery seems to have a very similar effect. But if someone's been having conservative treatment for a long period of time and they haven't been getting better, then surgery is obviously an option for these patients. And finally, talking about our exercises in specifically and, and rehab. So first thing with rehab we really want to think about is unloading the tendons. So if there are things they're doing that are specifically aggravating their shoulder, we want to make sure that this is minimized because we want to reduce that irritation, reduce that pain down, allow them to just get a little bit less pain so they can move better and then load them up and progressively load them from there. In early phase of rehab, you know, we want to work on things like isometrics, but it doesn't have to be isometrics. I think isometrics are often given at the start because they're easy to do and they're not too painful. Um, but if you can get patients doing other things, great. This is just a guideline, really. There's no musts with this, but I would start with more isometrics type stuff. This is because it's not going to be that painful. So you want to pick exercises that aren't too painful for patients in the, in the short term. Build their confidence, build their uh, locus of control, and then elevate them and escalate them from there. So mid to late phase of rehab, you want to get going with the things like your full range of motion um, rotational exercises, your full range of motion um, strengthening exercises, gradual progression of strengthening, things like your lateral raises, um, external rotation with dumbbells, with bands, rows, um, all these sorts of exercises. I've put a video together for specifically for subacromial impingement exercises, going through all these phases of um, exercise and also kind of examples and showing you which ones I really like. And so I'll link that somewhere in the card above or, and in the description below of this video. And then we would move on to our late phase. So late phase, we're going into more sport-specific drills, plyo drills, plyometrics drills, and more um, dynamic loading. So things like using a tennis ball, throwing, um, doing your Y balances with your shoulder stability work, doing press-ups, doing more um, sport-specific drills, basically. Um, loading, into, loading heavier into your external rotation, external rotation at 90 degrees, because we know that's where a lot of problems and people have problems with this condition. So overhead type activities, basically. So you want to be basically progressing through more of your stability to start with isometric drills in neutral where there's not really much pain, then moving on to more of your full range of motion and then moving into more of your plyometric drills. Perturbations are really good as well. So where you're actually moving, someone's going into a certain position where they would throw and you're pressing and moving, on, moving the hands, so they're having to control that stability around that, that area. So all these things can be really useful and that's the general progression that you would go through with exercises. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, it really helps the channel out. It massively gives me confidence that what I'm doing is helpful, is really helping you guys out. So yeah, really, really appreciate the feedback and I love the comments on these videos. So please leave some comments down below. Leave some comments down below on you know what you struggle with when you're treating impingement patients. Um, that would be really useful and then we can have a little discussion around that. Um, couple of videos up here um, that you, I think you'll like. I've linked in the exercises and also the special testing that you can do for this condition. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you next time.